Now, all of those findings rely on being able to compare the experimental population to the control population. If, De if Dmitry Belayev had not, in the very beginning, had the foresight to have the control population, we wouldn't know if the selection for friendliness and aggression actually caused the changes that we're seeing. It could be that you know you see curly tails and floppy ears and all these other things because the foxes lived in cages or because um, you know where they lived. I mean, there are a million other, or what they ate. Um, but we know because the control line was kept in absolutely identical conditions that it had to be the selection against aggression and interest that caused the morphological changes, even though they were only selecting for behavior. That's amazing. So they also, when they measured the physiology of the uh, experimental foxes, they found that the uh, serotonergic system had changed in the experimental line versus control. Uh, the serotonin is actually higher in the experimental line, and that is um, basically a way to sort of put a break on um, risky behavior or aggressive behavior. And the corticosteroid response to stress is much lower in the experimental line. So your adrenal glands are on top of your kidneys and they produce um, uh, things like cortisol, which is associated with the fight or flight response. Uh, and that was downregulated. It was reduced in the uh, experimental foxes relative to the control. So not only do you see morphological changes, but you see physiological changes that are involved with aggression and stress. And finally, of course, you saw a lot of behavioral changes. But the neat thing is the behavioral changes weren't just things that they had selected for, like being approaching uh, and being friendly. It was things like tail wagging and barking and crying uh, uh, in, into adulthood. Uh, and so there's much higher levels of barking and crying and tail wagging in the experimental line than in the control population. And having worked with these foxes, I can tell you that you know they are absolutely um, adorable because when you see them, they cry and whine and they really, really want you to come uh, touch them and interact with them. Whereas the control line that has not been bred for this, they tend to sort of stay away uh, and um, uh, not want to approach. And they certainly don't bark and cry if you don't touch them. So it's incredible that they selected for one thing. They selected for interest in humans uh, and uh, approach behavior, and you get all these changes. This has huge impact on how we think about how evolution actually works. Remember, evolution being a change in allele frequency over time. But it means that genes are busy. They do multiple things, and the genes that must have changed in the population, the allele frequency that changed in the population to cause a reduction in, in aggression towards people and also interest um, and approach towards people, they also must be involved in producing uh, the morphological traits and the physiological traits that we see also change. Um, so there are accidental byproducts of selection against aggression that tend to show up again and again, uh, and that's what's suggested by the foxes because it's obviously not just the foxes that have floppy ears, it's all sorts of domesticated animals. It's not just the foxes that have curly tails or piebald coats or the star mutation. And so really what the implications of the fox experiment is, is that Dmitry Belayev had discovered what domestication is. If you want to define it very quickly, domestication is selection against aggression and it is selection for interest uh, in people and, and the willingness and even desire to be with people. Uh, and as a result, you see all the changes uh, that we see across lots of different domesticated animals. So Dmitry Belayev really uh, had solved the mystery here. Um, and uh, for our question though, the question of why is it that uh, dogs are so good at using human gestures and our hypothesis that maybe it's something that occurred during domestication that those dogs that could really communicate better were at a, uh, an advantage during domestication uh, and that's why dogs are so good at using human gestures well this sets up the ultimate test because the experimental population of foxes they are essentially domesticated so what about them they uh, are they going to be uh, really good at using human gestures since essentially the experimental line looks so much like domesticated um, animals. And then the second thing that was interesting is there was no selection by the Russian scientist on 
the communicative ability of these foxes. They weren't playing the gesture game. They uh, weren't playing communicative intention games with the foxes over the 50 years. In fact, none of those games had even been invented uh, when Dmitry Belayev began doing these studies. Um, so they, they clearly the foxes hadn't been selected to do this. Um, they had only been selected for interest in people. So our question was, if it really was domestication that has made dogs so remarkable at using gestures, what will the foxes do? And what we found when we went and played our game and we hid food in one of two places, uh, and you can see uh, my collaborator pointing to one cup over another, and we compared fox kits from the experimental line and the control line. Uh, and uh, what we saw was that the experimental line was really good at using the human gestures and the control line was not so good. Now, the important thing that we did here is we actually spent a lot of time getting the control pups who were really young uh, and didn't quite have their adult fear system uh, online yet. We spent a lot of time playing with them, practicing with them, having them make choices um, to get them ready. We actually spent five weeks exposing them to people, uh, sort of socializing them. Whereas the experimental fox kits, when it was time to play the, play the test game with them, we literally just went and got them um, from their uh, home cage and we went and played the games with them and they had almost no exposure to people relative to the control kits. So even though the control kits had much more exposure to people, what we see is that the experimental population, uh, they actually, this is a comparison to dog puppies, they, on the 18 uh, repetitions we gave them, got it right about 15 times when we pointed, uh, whereas dog puppies uh, were about at that same level. But when we look at the control line, the control line was significantly below uh, the performance of the experimental line. Now, the interesting thing is that the control line did use the human cues just at a lower level. So that five weeks of exposure actually helped the foxes that were in the control line sort of get used to humans and show some proficiency. Uh, and, and that's really interesting when we think about the origin of the ability of uh, dogs, or in this case, the experimental foxes, to use human gestures. It's not that, it's probably not the case that um, the, the, the dogs are, just have a completely new ability to use gestures. It's probably that uh, wolves, or in the case of the control foxes, that if you give them a lot of socialization and you give them um, a significant amount of practice, they can use gestures too. And it's that ability that then when you domesticate an animal, then increases and becomes even more extreme and allows for the remarkable skill we see in dogs and of course in the experimental foxes here. Now I wasn't convinced yet. I wanted to make sure that we measured this in a couple of ways uh, because it was so interesting and important for understanding the origin of dogs' remarkable abilities.